Amen. You had enough dancing time to relax. Oh, I've just got one little thing. Just one thing to share, the one about the deer panted for the water. Here in New Zealand we've got so much water, so we really don't relate to what that means. Um, I was in, in Gary in the desert, and there was these deer that were literally trying to eat rocks. And it's really then that you realise how a deer really pants for water. If you're in a desert and there is no water, then it's really significant that you know, about the water and how important it is if you're in that situation. Uh, and then close by in a Gili, there's a little there's a um, spring. It's called David's Well, and it's like the only little bit of drinking water in this massive, great big desert area. So um, that song is always very special for me. Seeing those deer and knowing that there was just no other water anywhere for absolute, you know, miles around. Yeah, and it is in the Psalms. So you sure came into the. Um, did he, did he ride the rock donkey into Jerusalem? No, he didn't. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. No, he didn't. Because there's an interesting thing. It was a bit Beth Page. Okay, got, the, got on the donkey of Beth Page. Beth Page is three kilometres from Jerusalem. Bethany is seven kilometres from Jerusalem. Okay, so and it was part of the importance of you know, thinking about how far you go. But on the um, so we're going into on the way to Jerusalem. Let's get confused. It's the old Jerusalem is defined by the the area which is actually on the east side, the west side of the Kidron Valley. Okay, the Kidron Valley runs down the middle, and you've actually got um, the, the the Mount of Olives is actually on the western side of um, the Kidron Valley. And so you come down the Kidron Valley, and it gets off the donkey. It's really good. And the thing is, but and the, the thing is, um, so when when is the palms? So, so where, do, where, where do the palms come from? Or come out of? People lift the palms, the wave? Whereabouts? Oh, no. it, it was actually as he was going out of Bethpage, three kilometres away. Okay? And the wave the donkey, but guess what? What day was it? A good day. Ah, no, let's, let's see if it's a thing, Sunday. Palm Sunday, and that's a very Catholic thing. To, it was as a Catholic thing to say seven days before the thing have a beautiful hallelujah before resurrection. Ah, that's exactly right, and that's the unfortunate thing is because no, it wasn't. It didn't happen then. It happened on the Friday. Okay, so on the Friday, um, which was the palms were done, we waved, and then so he went into the temple on. The, on the Shabbat, and then carrying on through there, you know, and then a couple of days, you think, oh, so when was Yeshua's preparation day? When he got his mates, because it's two days before, they checked out the upper room and got things ready, so that was on the Tuesday night. So he had the, on the Tuesday, he had the um, his last supper, and then he went out and right in the night and in the morning, actually at night, Judas did this lovely thing, and he um, then was in, in, in the the area of where they had the um, um, it was the Sanhedrin, which was totally illegal. Um, during the middle of the night, no witnesses, anything, and so found guilty. Um, and they said, how, how, how is it possible? How could they go to, you know, that's why it's, they said, it just can't be right in the scripture that causes it, because he had to go to get whipped at, um, by King uh, Herod. And but Herod's place was in Hebron, somewhere else, and 
Ah, and and also the uh, pilot, well, pilot was, his place was actually up in Caesarea, Caesarea. Yeah. So how does that work? That's a long way to walk, and, yeah. especially these days. Well, that's a fact. The, um, where the temple is actually located, well, the, the actual um, mosque uh, on there, that used to be actually where the, um, the Roman uh, the Praetorian guard were. Had, we had, had to allow for a thousand men on that area. Um, and so that's why there's some debate as to whether or not the temple actually was located there. Yeah. Um, because that's actually where the, the Romans actually were. <clears throat> and that's why it's more likely that that temple is more likely towards um, King David's city, which is on the edge. But anyway, the, um, so the, uh, when you come to what I'm talking about on... What do I forget? I'm going to the Sanhedrin now. Oh, the Sanhedrin? Having the trial at night. That's oh, trial at night. And then it comes to the morning, Wednesday morning. Hello, then Wednesday morning. It's actually come through and they... Yeshua's on the cross by 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock takes about the third hour. Okay, and then he is on the cross and actually has to be off the cross an hour before sundown, which is five o'clock. Well, actually died at, what? Three o'clock. Around three o'clock. It's a pretty short um, period. And um, so then they had to give it time. Then that was on Wednesday night evening, because he had to die before Passover. Um, and that's actually why he had to suffer before he died before. And so then it comes to Wednesday night, and that then flips over to Thursday, Friday, Shabbat, and three days, three nights, and it says, sure, it's interesting because it, it, the scripture actually says, early in the morning as the sun rise, oh, it doesn't say that he rose then, it says when the sun rose, that the woman came along to visit. Ah, and of course, he wasn't there because he'd already risen after Shabbat. And done his different things. So that's how the sequence actually runs in your days. So I hope that's able to use, use that to explain to people actually how it actually works. And it's written in the scriptures. And it actually you show, so you don't have to do, so you don't have to um, do um, mathematical gymnastics and say, come up with things like, oh, you know, the Jewish concept of a day can sometimes fall into just a part of the day. And, and then you actually look at the Talmud and then you're asking, that's rubbish. It doesn't actually say that. And, and that is not a Jewish concept. So, you know, the different ones, the people come up with these different ideas and then, you know, what the days are and make it really short. And just read what the scripture says. And he says, the only, the only prophecy I will give you is that of Jonah. Hello. So, if you don't want to believe in the scriptures, well, throw it out and just believe what you like. Either that or read what it says. It's not too complex. But anyway, so that would explain that. So we now in have a wonderful text to me and from Charmaine. Absolutely. Hi, um, I'm Charmaine and I'm very happy to be here to have become part of the congregation. And when um, I offered to a testimony, I had no idea. I've, I've had lots of awesome experiences with God. I had no idea what to talk about. And then um, I felt God telling me to talk about three incidents that were all happening around prayer. And um, all three in India, I think, different times. So um, the first thought was 
we know we can approach God in prayer, but we often hesitate. We we think that I, I should do this myself. I should be able to do this. Or at least that's how I go or how I've been. Um, and this particular day, I learned that this isn't God's way to for me to try and do things myself. We absolutely need to call out to God instantly. Call out to God instantly. So we were in India, in Central India, and we were um, having what called Jesus Heals campaigns. And the, we were meeting in an area of about 1,500 to 2,000 people. And the whole area was walled in, like a big um, piazza, a big square. And we had, we always started with worship and then the walking and, and then uh, prayer ministry, healing afterwards. And we were still at the stage where we were worshiping. And all of a sudden, um, it was like life suddenly went into slow motion. I could see all these stones, like, up, uh, it's like a picture in my mind, all these stones about the four of us. And I'm thinking, oh, we're about to be stoned. <laughs> But the sister next to me, Rosemary, puts up her hand absolutely instantly and says, go on, put up a wall of protection. And we watch the stones falling and then sliding down. And apparently there was, the wall didn't go right to the ground because one stone slid underneath and cut one of the Indian pastor's big toe really badly as his toe I understand. And other than that, no one inside this area was injured. Wow. It was Rosemary didn't stop and think like me. Oh, oh we've been stuck in no 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 it was just God put up a wall of protection and because she instantly called out of God, we were all protected. Then there was a there was another occasion um, also in India, and um, I I I'm normally an early riser, and I was it was my habit to do my Bible study in the garden. It's very hot, so I, the garden was sort of on the side of the hill. So I went to the bottom of the hill, and um, I did this every morning, just sitting there praying, reading my Bible. And this particular morning, um, someone hadn't closed the gate properly. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly looked up and I was surrounded by a pack of dogs, wild dogs. Mm -hmm. And they were looking very threatening. They don't look like our lovely domestic dogs. <laughs> and um, of course I started praying, praying, and nothing seemed to be happening. Um, I'm kind of doubting, what am I doing wrong? We keep praying, keep praying. And so sometimes we have to wait on God and things can look really, really bad. We have to wait. And then God actually woke someone up who came out of their room in their pajamas, a man, came running down the hill, screaming and yelling and waving his arms around, generally looking like a big ball of action. And the dogs just ran off and out the gate. And I duly got a lecture <laughs> telling me all the things that I should have done, which I just didn't know about. Um, so sometimes we really do have to wait on God. And the third incident was um, when, when we've finished all the prayer and people are giving their life to Christ, then everyone that's there just comes forward for prayer. And there's usually translators, so there's a prayer team that lines up against the wall under the stage sort of thing. And then people just move forward and the interpreter comes, speaks to the Indian person, and they give the person who's praying one word, stomach, arm, head, whatever their problem is, you've got one word to pray with. And so you're really relying on Holy Spirit to tell you. So um, 
this particular lady came and stood, and you just pray until everyone's gone, then you go home to bed. <laughs> so about halfway through, this lady came and stood in front of me, and the word was abdomen. So, okay, <laughs> not even stomach, just abdomen. So I had no idea except abdomen. So I started to pray, and we kind of know in our spirit they're being healed, and the next one goes, and I knew she hadn't been healed yet. So I kept praying and praying and praying and praying and still nothing was happening and she was looking confused. I started to feel confused. What's happening? What's happening? And, and, and by now I'm starting to think in terms of what am I doing wrong? As though, it's, as though I the one who's been healing all these people. But I felt as I was letting her down. And... Um, In the end, I just had to to tell her I'm sorry, and she left. But it just so happened that this was a place, I think it's the only place I can remember, that we went back to a second day. And the next day, um, this lady that I had prayed for appeared on the stage. And there was, um, she had a proper interpreter interpreting all her words and apparently she'd had a growth in her abdomen and she was due to have an operation the next day which she was very frightened about because this is India <laughs> it's not like New England or America or New Zealand so she was very worried about it and she had she said to, she said that you know the lady that she had prayed for looked as though she wasn't happy and so she wasn't happy so she was affected by my lack of faith, very humbly. And um, however, she went home and went to bed. And when she woke up in the morning, she felt good. She felt normal. But she still went to the hospital. And she told them, it's gone. It's gone. And they x-rayed her and did tests. And praise God, she came back and shared with us that evening. And God had actually completely healed her. Um, and, and, it, and it really heightened to me. We don't, we don't want to take anything on to ourselves that isn't of us. Until I encountered this lady, I knew it wasn't me that was doing it. I knew it was God. But when it didn't happen the way I expected, I started to think it must be me. So we just have to keep trusting in God when we're praying, even if it looks like nothing's happening, he's God. He has his perfect timing. So those are my three prayer experiences. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I haven't got any words, but you know this one.
governor. The governor questioned him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? You say so, Yeshua said. And while he was accused by the ruling Kohanim and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Don't you hear how many things that they testify against you? Yeshua did not answer, not even one word. So the governor was greatly amazed. Now during the feast, the governor was accustomed to release to the crowd one prisoner, anyone they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner named Yeshua Bar Abba. So when they were gathered together, Pilate said to them, Which one do you want me to release to you? Yeshua who is Bar Abba or Yeshua who is called Mashiach? For he knew that they had handed him over out of envy. While Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message saying, Don't have anything to do with that righteous man, for today I've suffered many things in a dream because of him. Now the ruling Kohanim and the elders persuaded the crowds that they should ask for Bar Abba and destroy Yeshua. But the governor responded, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Bar Abba. Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Yeshua, who is called Mashiach? Execute him, all of them say. But, but Pilate said, Why? What evil has he done? But they kept shouting all the more, saying, Let him be executed. When Pilate saw he was accomplishing nothing, but instead a riot was starting, he took some water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this blood, he said. You see to it yourselves. All the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released to them Bar Abba. And after he had Yeshua scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the governor's soldiers took Yeshua into the praetorium and gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe around him. And after braiding a crown of thorns, they placed it on his head and put a staff in his right hand. And falling on their knees before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him and took the staff and beat him over the head. When they finished mocking him, they stripped the robe off him and put his own clothes back on him, and they led him away to crucify him. As they came out, they found the man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They forced him into service to carry Yeshua's crossbeam. And when they came to the place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of the skull, they offered him wine mixed with gall to drink. But after tasting, he was unwilling to drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothing among themselves by casting lots. And they sat down and kept guard over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him, saying, This is Yeshua, King of the Jews. Then two outlaws were executed with him, one on the right hand and one on the left, those passing by jeering at him, shaking their heads, saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are Ben Elohim, come down from the stake. Likewise, the ruling Kohanim, along with the Torah scholars and elders, were also mocking him. He saved others, they were saying, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the stake and we will believe him. He trusts in God. Let, he trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am Ben Elohim. Even the outlaws who were executed with him were ridiculing him in the same way. Is that it, Joel? 46. 46, okay.
Now about the sixth hour, darkness fell upon the, the land until the ninth hour. About the ninth hour, Yeshua cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama shabachthani. And they, that is, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Thank you, John. Thank you for what you've been doing. It's just tremendous. It's been obviously a lot of weeks and weeks of work to bring us all together. It's just, you know, it's just wonderful. Wonderful just being here together and fellowshipping. What a scripture. What our Lord Yeshua, what he went through for us. It's amazing. If you get a chance, um, Psalms 22, it just resonates, Psalms 22, all through that reading. So when you get a chance, just read it, it's all there. The last scripture you shared, Eli, Eli, Sabachini, is it? Um, Sabachini. 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 And that's uh, in Aramaic or Hebrew. So they're similar, they're similar, aren't they? I think L L is L. Yeah, L is. So prove something, isn't it? When you look in the Greek, when the Greek they take the translation, they say it in the Hebrew because they say they're hearing it in Hebrew, but they're translating it. So they're saying these are the pure words, but here we'll translate it. My father, my my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And they've translated it. So. It's, one of the proofs that uh, at least Matthew and probably a lot of the other New Testament was written in Hebrew. I got a question. Where is the. Oh, sorry? I wouldn't jump to that conclusion. What, what about Aramaic then? Can we jump to that one? No? It's written in. Maybe. You're, um, you're from the Greek school, maybe? Yeah. Could be, could fall either side. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're at this Pesach camp. What's the story here? Joel, the dormitories, the wives have it, the husband and wives have been set up with nice, beautiful, dump, um, bunk, um, queen size suites, suites and queen size beds, and bunk beds. Are you trying to tell us something? Is there something? that um, husbands and wives are not meant to do over this time. Or... <laughs> That's just a joke. <laughs> just, just what. Well, secret. <laughs> but we're all here together as family and this is this is really special. And it's just watching as people dancing, praising and worship and even even putting a even putting a lamb on the spit and Helping in the kitchen, that's all worship as well. And coming together, what's it going to be like in paradise with him? What's it going to be like? Well, why did Yeshua have to go through all this? In Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Now we know that all things work together for good for those who love and know him who are called according to his purpose. And so all these terrible things he went through were for us, for you and for me, because he wanted, he had to take all those bad things, all the bad things of the world and work it to become good. And Yeshua did all this to fulfill the Father's good purpose for us. And Yeshua paid the price. With his precious life and his precious blood for our sins and with his life. So that we, we're the ones who's meant to die. If, if someone does a mistake, you're called to go to the court. You can't, you don't go get someone else. Well, they try to sometimes. Someone will be falsely accused. But normally they'll catch you, bring you before the judge. You have to pay the price for what you did. And every one of us has sin, and we all have to pay the price. Mm. But Yeshua did it before on behalf of us. This thing about the Lord working all things together good for his good purpose. Over six years ago, 
Over six years and five weeks ago, I was working really hard as an electrician, and I met a gentleman. He worked hard. He works hard today still, like I used to, and uh, working big hours, and just taking your whole life. And I did an injury to myself, and um, can't do what I used to do. I can't earn all the big money. But the Lord's worked it together for good because here I am today. I'd be working on a job site right now, yeah. <laughs> making money, serving money. Mm. And I'm here. And and to me, what I've had to go through is I would never want it taken away because I wouldn't be keeping Shabbat. Mm. I wouldn't be here and learning with Joel and Sharon and be part of their family yes, and part of all of you. And so... Praise the Lord that by the grace, He gives me grace to go through all. His, His grace is sufficient for me. And I just praise the Lord that every time, and when we're going through things, and each one of us goes through things at different times, we can always cry out and call to Him, and His grace is sufficient for us. Yes. And when we read, and we find that Yeshua is forsaken. Everyone left them. No one went and said, hey, you can't do that. We're taking him. The disciples didn't form a thing and say, we're taking him. We're gone. We're out into the hills. They all, they all went out to the hills. They all left him. Everyone forsaken. And if we come to him, he will never forsake us. Because he was forsaken. He says, I will never leave you or forsake you. So that with confidence we say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what can man be to you. just want to share a story, and this is a very personal story, and I don't normally share this. Is my first memory was when I was almost three years old. I remember these words, and it's clear in my mind, and it might sound really weird to you. Rudd, we need more buckets. And what would have happened if a big storm had come along and my mum had pots and pans and Tupperware containers and everything and she had them and then she, I heard her say, it's coming out through the wall. And I was not even three. I remember crawling down to the end of the bed. She'd moved me into the centre bedroom. There was a centre bedroom for some reason and we moved down there and she's trying to collect the water and the water's all puddling on the floor. But not long after that, we, we struggled, my parents struggled, they, they, my dad worked two jobs and they struggled, I had two other brothers and one of them um, needed a lot of time and attention and my mum was, it was, it was very hard on her. And um, I remember, I was only three years, three months, maybe people don't normally remember things like that, do you? How far do you go back and you remember? But I talked to my mum later and she said, how did you remember that? And I remember I was in bed and she, and I couldn't move and my mum asked would you like an ice block and I couldn't even talk. My, I hadn't eaten or drank apparently for seven days but I didn't know that at that time. And my mum brought me back a red ice block and she said here you go and she put it in my hand and it fell out of my hand so she got it and put it in a glass and came back later and she said oh, oh it's melted and then she left. And I was by myself, and then I remember it's crystal clear. I, I, I remember I, did, I left my body and I went up to the ceiling, and I was up at the ceiling, and I thought, oh, I'll turn around. And I looked down, and I could see myself, and I could see the whole room. Mm. And everything was at peace. And I, I turned around. Then something said, turn around. So it was like something just turned around and turned around to face up and the roof had gone, the ceiling had gone, the roof had gone. And I saw this light up there. But up until that time I felt forsaken. I felt everyone, I felt forsaken. I had, I just had no strength and I felt forsaken. But then everything was all right. Now, and, and there was a light and you were going up towards it, but then everything stopped. And apparently I'd been taken to hospitals and hospital for quite a while and, and I was able, they were able to get me better. It took quite a while, but they got me in 
got me back. But two years later, only five, I still remember it to this day. I've been going to, i been going one week to Methodist Church, and next week I went to Presbyterian. My dad was a Methodist, you come this week. Next week, mum said, you're going to the, uh, my dad said, come to Presbyterian. My mum said, you know, you're coming to Methodist. I was going between the two. And, um, and I, my mum started going to Pentecostal Church, and, and there was a Sunday school, an after, after school Sunday school club, and they had lots of games and fun, and I went along, and the Sunday school teacher put an altar call, and I was only five, and all the other kids were older than me, and she had an altar call, and she said, that Yeshua will never leave you or forsake you. You see, he said, your parents one day won't be there. Your brothers won't be there. And I've been in that place before. And I was only five. And I just said, I, I need him. And she said, he is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. She said, your brother might be close. And I was close to me, especially my big brother. We were close. But she said, no, he's closer than that. And he... Your brother, big brother won't be there later on. Your mum and your dad won't be there later on. And your friends and others won't be there. But he will always be there. I wanted that. I, I was so small, I pulled on my, my brother was seven, uh, big brother was seven, and my yeah, seven, and I pulled on his, his sleeve collar and said, I have to go up. And he said, you don't understand. And he said, I understand, I have to go up. My mum said, why is he complaining? But he says he wants to go, oh, he's too young, he doesn't understand. Mm. He went, the other children went up and they received him. And I'm like, I can't have him. Mm. I still remember it. We went home and uh, my mum went to put me to bed and they said, my mum's, mum said, okay, we're going to pray, pray. And I said, oh, can we please pray this prayer the Sunday school teacher prayed. I remember trying to go on tippy-toe and I tried to hear the prayer so I could say it myself even though they were eyed up the front and I thought, maybe I can say it back here. I couldn't hear it, I missed out. I said to my mum, I want to pray the same prayer the Sunday school. A teacher prayed. And my mum said, yes, yes. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for looking after Brendan. My mum, that's not the prayer. That's not the prayer. She says, okay, now you're going to go to sleep. And she tried again and she tried again. In the end, I said, no. She, and she'll say, I've been naughty. And I said, no, I'm not going to, we're not going to finish until you pray the same prayer. And I said, because I need to ask, I need to ask Yeshua into my heart. And that stays, we said, Jesus, and he will be your forever friend. And so I asked him, to my, my mum led me in the prayer. From that time in, he's never left me or forsaken me. I've been a bit busy doing my own things, but he never left me. Even while I was busy off doing my own things, busy trying to make money and trying to get into a house which doesn't have a leaky roof <laughs> and all these things, mm. he's never left me. And Yeshua went through that so that we would not be forsaken. Yeshua was surrounded. Psalms 22, it's in there, verse 12. Many bulls have surrounded me, and strong ones of Bashan have encircled me. Someone else was surrounded before that for a period of time. Who was, who, which people were surrounded? they just come out of Egypt. The Israelites. Got up to the Red Sea. The Lord had placed them there. Those bullish Egyptians surrounded. Not much chance there when you've got the big army there. But Moshe, Moshe said to the people, don't be afraid. Stand still. I'll be trying to swim across the river. And see? But stand still and see. Now I'm going to say it in the Hebrew, and I'm going to say it wrong, as I always do. Okay, no one ever says that. You go right, but I'm learning. <laughs> Stand still and see the Yeshua of Yahweh. In fact, it says Yeshua. Finish this chapter. See the Yeshua of Yahweh. 
Yahweh means Yah, and it's short for Yahweh. Shua stands for salvation or deliverance or the rescue. Jesus actually means nothing. It's got no meaning, but Yeshua means Yahweh saves us. Yahweh delivers us. Yahweh rescues us. Every time you say Yeshua, you're saying, save me. Yahweh, save me. Every time we say his name, because only he can save you. Not my job as an electrician learning lots of money. That won't save me. My mum and dad won't save me. My brothers won't save me. Joel won't save me. Only he will save me. Today we're going to have matzah. Eat lots of matzah. Today we're going to celebrate this feast. But even and even when we practice the Shabbat, but those things in themselves don't save us. But in those things, they direct us and lead us to Yeshua. Because he is in all those things. And so as we do all those things and as we go through and do the basic, look for each thing. Because Yeshua is in each and everything. I have more to say, but uh, I just want to finish the air in his name. Thank you, Yeshua. I just sense in my heart someone's um, someone's got a prayer. Someone might have a prayer just to thank Yeshua for it. what he had to go through for us. Does anyone have a prayer? Anything that Well, I don't know if this is right. You will know, Shimshon, because you know Hebrew. But while Amy was reading about Barabbas, the Bar Abbas, it occurred to me that it meant son of the father, which was the same as Yeshua, who was the son of the father. And it made me think of the two scapegoats. One was left free, and one was the sacrifice. And I just thought, that was kind of a picture of Yeshua becoming our sacrifice mm. and Bar Abbas being left go. Mm. Mm. I don't know if that's got any real meaning. Oh, no, fantastic. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Abba Father, we just look back at that time and we are overawed with what Yeshua did for us, Father. And what you did for us, because whatever he felt on that cross, you felt too as his father. So Father, we can't imagine what it must have been like to have felt forsaken by you. That probably was the worst thing that he could have experienced for us, Father. And there are times when we sometimes feel that you are not there for us, but that's not true. It's us who have moved away. So, Father, bring us close. Bring us back to the cross, Father. Just like we danced a little earlier on with the billows, let us embrace the cross once more, the cross of Yeshua. And let us remember it as we go through this weekend, that we are each and every one of us saved by the blood of the Lamb that has been put on the lintels of our hearts, Father. I pray, Father God, that we would be worthy of walking in your light and following the angel of light, Father, as those Israelites did through the desert, Father, as they followed you in that pillar of light and flame, and the, pi the pillar of flame of light and the cloud in the morning. So, Father, help us to watch out for your move and to be having ears that would care, especially in this day and age, Father, give us an awareness of the signs of the times, Father. Help us to prepare those who do not know you and do not know the sacrifice you have made for them. Help us, Father, especially with our families and those who don't have an inkling of what your kingdom is all about. Father, help us to share Yeshua and his blood 
on everyone that we meet. And we thank you for this weekend, Father. We thank you for the food that we're about to eat. And we give you praise and worthy and thanks in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen.